Good day, folks, and welcome back to the channel. What we got there? I have something here that is out of this world. A meteorite. Today, I would like to get 4,700 for my stone. I mean, my big problem is I don't deal in meteorites. I want someone to look at it, do whatever he does. That be rock is older than this planet. This is a graded catalog the meteorite. This is a $4,000 meteorite. OK. I'll give you 1800 bucks. Could you do 2250? It'll look beautiful in here under the lights. I'll give you 21. I'm not going to, I won't give you a dime more. I mean, that's, that's it. 2100 sounds fair. OK, deal, man. Thank you very much. Today, we'll show you all the times when Pawn Stars made terrible deals. Guy brought in a diamond tiara that belonged to First Lady Ida McKinley. He thinks it's worth 75000 That seems pretty high to me. A lot of bird so, feathers, wings, pieces like this were quite popular. The diamonds are fine quality for the period. They're what you would expect to see. The idea that this was convertible and has the fittings for both the brooch and also the tiara, and I think that's kind of neat. So the question becomes, what do we know about the provenance? How can we substantiate the provenance of the piece itself? What would it go in your store? In a retail store like Fred Layton, we would see this piece sell for $75,000. OK, sort of what he's wanting. So yeah. we're going to have to talk a little bit. But uh, thanks, man. I appreciate it. My pleasure. Kunzai. Davey, a friend of Rick's, wanted to sell a family gem. The gem has been in his family for generations. Rick has a bone to pick with that. Kunzai has only been around since the 90s. Davey, what's up? I need some money. Got a family heirloom. So check that out. It's a Kunzai. It's been in my family for generations and generations. That's all I know. They only discovered the stone like right around 1900, so it hasn't been in for generations and generations. Davey is a regular customer. He wants 15,000 in exchange for the Kunzai. Rick asked to involve his geologist. Davey is offended that Rick doesn't trust him enough, but he should know better. Rick does not joke around when it comes to his business. I come to see the guys at the pawn shop quite often. I'm going to get 15 grand out of Rick. I'm going to have Jeff, my gemologist, check it out. Well, you don't trust me? You don't think it's real? No, I don't. I thought me and Rick were better buddies because I didn't think he needed to see a gemologist. Jeff, his expert, is thrilled when Rick brings him the Kunzai. A Kunzai that big is rare to find in his career. His first test proves that it is a natural Kunzai. He performs his second test just to be sure and confirms that the gem is a natural Kunzai. He places its value at about $9,600. If it's glass, most likely there's going to be air bubbles on inclusions that tell me that this is natural. This is a refractive index machine, and it measures the way light goes through the stone. And from that, we can tell if this is a natural kunzite or if it's something else. And as I can see through here, it has the right refractive index to be kunzite. So yes, this is a real kunzite. How much does it go for? 30 to $50 a carat. So we're talking at $30 a carat, right at 9,600 bucks, right in that neighborhood? Yeah, ballpark. Rick is right to think that Davey will try and get as much money for it as possible. Davey opens their negotiations by asking for $15,000. Rick counteroffers for $5,000. Knowing Davey, he's gonna try and squeeze me for all it's worth. <laughs> I feel it's worth 15 grand. It deserves big money. I'll give you five grand. Davey suggests meeting in the middle at $10,000, but the highest Rick will go is $6,000. With a bit of encouragement, Rick agrees to buy it for $6,500. 15 grand, 5 grand, 10 grand. I'll go 10 G's. No, I'll give you 6 grand. 7,500? 6 grand. 65? All right, 65. All right. All right, give me your ID. Cardinal ring. Bob walks in looking to sell a 19th century papal cardinal ring with a garnet gem. The ring is engraved by Fremont Murig, one of the best jewelry makers in the game. Their pieces have even been displayed in the Louvre. I have a cardinal's ring I'd like to sell you. This is supposedly from a cardinal? Supposedly from a cardinal. It's from the 19th century. And we know that because of the jeweler, a gentleman by the name of Fromont Marie. Fromont Maurice is a big name in jewelry. They even have really exquisite pieces that are in the Louvre. Bob asked for $6,000. The stones could be of higher quality, but the ring has a valuable history. Rick thinks so too. If this was manufactured by them, it's worth a lot more money. So how much do you want for it? I'd love to get 6,000. The value is the value in antiquity, it's value in history. If it's a Cardinals ring, I mean, it's definitely gonna add a lot of value on top of everything else. But there have been many Cardinals, so finding out if it's real should be easy. Bob has had the ring for a long time, and he's sure it's real. 
Cardinals. I know there's over 100 of them. But the thing is, I have to verify that it's actually a Cardinals ring. See, I have faith, because I've had the ring in my possession. Let me go give someone a call. I'll get them down here, find out if it's a Cardinals ring. Okay. Sounds good, sir. Mark is an expert in historical artifacts. Cardinal rings were rare in the 7th century, and even more so now. He begins by trying to figure out its church origins. His search is futile. The lack of the Pope's mark means it never belonged to any office. Okay, the ring of office in the Catholic Church goes back to the 7th century AD when they started officially saying, this is how we're going to recognize your office. That's an unusual piece. In here, you've got a very nice cross, almost a Maltese cross on both sides. Unfortunately, there is no other symbology of the Pope on this ring. It is probably not a ring of office. Rick is still interested on account of the jewelry manufacturer. The jewels are garnet and emerald. He offers Bob $1,500, then $2,000, and the ring is sold. We still have an antique ring from a famous jewelry house, so I'm still interested. It's a garnet. Those are emeralds. Okay. Just so you know, my jewelers in the back can make this ring for under $1,000. But we do have the manufacturer. And shoot me an offer. 1500 bucks. Whew. And what's the best you can do? 2000 period. You got a deal. Apparently, you're blessed. Thank you, sir. OK, I'll meet you right up there. Diamond Tiara. A guy brings in a crown of diamonds that belonged to First Lady Ida McKinley into the shop. She was the wife of the 25th president of the United States of America, William McKinley. He thinks the piece is worth $75,000. Guy brought in a diamond tiara that belonged to First Lady Ida McKinley. He thinks it's worth $75,000. That seems pretty high to me. Rick brings in his experts to appraise the item. Greg specializes in antique jewelry. He asserts that the jewelry holds many marks commonly used during its time period. The diamonds on it are authentic, the adjustable clutch is a bonus in its favor. Well, I called up my buddy Greg to check this thing out. Oh, there it is. <laughs> it's an interesting looking piece. I'm the owner of Fred Layton. We specialize in vintage and antique jewelry. The bird feathers, wings, pieces like this were quite popular. The diamonds are fine quality for the period. They're what you would expect to see. The idea that this was convertible and has the fittings for both the brooch and also the tiara. And I think that's kind of neat. So the question becomes, what do we know about the provenance? How can we substantiate the provenance of the piece itself. The customer produces a picture that links the piece to the first lady. Despite all of its green flags, Greg informs them that the price is subjective. It's seen in this official White House First Lady photograph. This is one of the events that was going on at the McKinley Museum. Certainly, it does link. You know, how much value that adds, it's a little bit open to interpretation. In a retail store, it could go for $75,000. The news is bittersweet for Rick, if he wants to acquire the piece, he will have to be much craftier than usual. What would it go in your store? In a retail store like Fred Layton, we would see this piece sell for $75,000. Okay, sort of what he's wanting. So yeah. we're gonna have to talk a little bit, but uh, thanks man, I appreciate it. My pleasure. Marie Antoinette's diamond buttons. Adam wants to relieve himself of his Marie Antoinette buttons. He doesn't deal with buttons. The only thing he knows about their owner is her execution. What can I help you with? Came to sell my buttons. They belong to Marie Antoinette. Marie Antoinette. Do you know a lot about Marie Antoinette? <laughs> Rick asks about their origins. Adam eases Rick's doubt by revealing that he got them through his errands as a rare book dealer. Rick then educates him about the rural girl who rose through the ranks to occupy such a viral role in the French Revolution. So where did you get these? I'm a rare book dealer. Where there's sometimes really fine books, you find some really interesting objects. What makes you think they belong to Marie Antoinette? On the box is the Bourbon coat of arms, which is something Marie Antoinette would have had on all of her possessions. Bourbons was the family name. After Marie Antoinette was married to Louis XVI, she became a bourbon. This woman loved living the high life, but the average French person who was basically starving at the time, they got sick of her really quick. Rick begins to look into the paste diamonds. These were glass with lead melted into them. Having a set of them is rare, but having a collection that belonged to Marie Antoinette is a golden ticket to dollar bills. These were called paste diamonds. They're sort of like glass diamond. This is glass with lead melted in it. This is definitely something fancy enough to be worn by a queen. Complete. A complete set is rare. There's a good market for stuff belonging to royals, but there's a lot of things we have to take into consideration here. Adam wants $10,000 for it. A second look at the case reveals something disappointing. The golden necklace at the bottom of the crest 
was post Marie Antoinette, so they could not have been hers. How much are you looking to get out of them? 10 grand. What happened was is French Revolution, Napoleon came to power, and later he was defeated. When the Bourbons reascended the throne, they modified their crest. And this necklace right here was added. This is post-Napoleon. Which means it can't be Marie Antoinette's because her head was gone by then. <laughs> Rick first offers $2,000, but Adam sticks by the $3,500. Corey pleads his case, and Rick finally agrees. That being said, though, we still have a bourbon coat of arms on the front of this thing. I mean, we're talking royalty. I'll give you two grand for it. I really don't want to go less than 3,500. I think it's it's fair. I'd say go ahead and do it for 35. All right, 3,500. You got it. Write him up, Corey. All right, come with me. My man, I'll write you out. Super Bowl ring. Chum Lee tries out a ring that makes him feel like the king of the world. Henry, the owner, got it from a deal with a client during a brokerage. Holy. Got the mother of all Super Bowl rings. Awesome. The biggest and baddest. I feel like a champion. <laughs> all right, where did you get this? I'm a broker and did a deal with me and never came back to get it. The championship ring is from a close call game between the Patriots and the Eagles. Though Rick does not like them, he reluctantly admits that the Patriots are pretty badass. Well, it's from Super Bowl 39. It's when they beat the Eagles. That was a close game. I mean, I know it came right down to the wire. It was like a three point game. Yeah, it was real close. I grew up in San Diego. I will never like the Patriots. As much as I hate to admit it, the New England Patriots have been pretty badass for the past decade. Rick inspects the ring. His habit of buying championship rings has made him a pro at it. He's skeptical about the manufacturer's mark. He plays it safe and calls his expert. Jeff, bring me my Patriots ring. I'm sort of a nut for championship rings. And with my collection, I have other Super Bowl rings I can compare all the markings with. This looks like it's in sloppy hand engraving. I mean, it's the nicest Super Bowl ring I have ever seen. But the manufacturer's mark doesn't look right. So I called in my buddy who's an expert to take a look. Jeremy displays his expertise in sports memorabilia by telling them more about the ring's history. This ring was the heaviest and it was the most expensive ring that they had ever made for any Super Bowl game. It's cast in 14K white gold. It's got 124 diamonds. And also it says three out of four. They won three Super Bowls out of the last four years, which is an absolutely remarkable feat that only the Dallas Cowboys had done previously to that. He looks it over and picks the same issue with the mark. The good news is that that year, rings were hand engraved. The diamonds, everything else looks to be legit. Just the markings on the bottom there, it's uh, certainly a little bit different than other rings I've seen. But they put so much into this ring, gold, diamonds, and everything. This thing was so enormous, they actually had to have somebody laser engrave each and every ring, as you see here. Okay, cool. Rick offers $18,000, but Jeremy drives a hard bargain. He walks out of the store $21,000 richer. Um, 18. I go 21. I'll give you 20 grand. Pass. 20 grand. Cash. If you go 20, you go 21. Just because I need a Super Bowl ring for every one of my fingers. Deal. Deal. Gold Egyptian Scarab Ring. Hillary would like to know whether her Egyptian scarab ring is real or fake. The 18th century ring has been in her family for two centuries. It is time to pass it on to someone who would appreciate it. I have here an Egyptian scarab ring. It was given to me by my father a couple of years before he passed away, and I'd like to know if this is the real thing or not. All right. So was your dad like Indiana Jones or something like that? Not, not in the least. <laughs> Rick questions if the ring is as old as Hillary claims. He is not comforted by a supporting document that accompanies the scarab. Scarabs are generally carved from stone and glazed either blue or green. It looks like an old scarab, but the question is, is it really 3,000 years old? Oh, what is this? Oh, that is the card from the guy that sold it over in Egypt. And he wrote on the back that it's guaranteed that it's from the 18th dynasty, uh, 1500 BC. Okay. The expert, Dr. Phineas, educates Rick on the symbolism of the ring. He points out things that corroborate its origins. The scarab is real, but its value is sadly very little. She has a scarab ring her grandmother picked up in Egypt, and this is the only paperwork she has right here. And remember, they don't have a better business bureau there. Yeah. <laughs> so this is probably a real scarab, though. I think that is a real scarab, and from the look of it, it looks 3,000 years old. Okay, so what do you think it's worth? Well, you can get a scarab like that, I'm gonna say right now, for maybe 250. Rick offers her $350, and despite Hillary's best efforts, Rick only adds $10 more for the ring. 500. 
No. <laughs> I'm being really, really nice at 350. I really am. 375? I'll tell you what, I will give you 360 bucks. All right. I'll take it. We got a deal then. We got All a right. deal. Follow me right up front. Sterling Silver Julius Caesar's head. Corey appraises a solid silver Julius Caesar head and bust. The bust was a prized centerpiece for years, but it's time for Spencer to let it go. So what do we got here? This is a solid silver Julius Caesar bust. I'm at the pawn shop today to sell my solid silver Julius Caesar bust. This bust was a prized possession. It was centerpiece over the fireplace. Everyone could see it when they walked in the house. He wants $75,000 for it. Corey checks the engravings for its details and the manufacturer. Upon hearing the price, Corey quickly involves his expert. Came from the Vatican, I guess, or has something to do with it. And it says right here, you got 500 ounces of silver. Silver's around 24 bucks an ounce. How much are you looking to get for it? I'm looking realistically for about 75,000. Do you mind if I have a buddy of mine come down and take a look at it? Yeah, yeah sounds good. Spencer is confident that he will get his money's worth. The expert reveals a very cool tidbit. The silver bus could have been done during Caesar's lifetime. There were also only 99 heads of the same kind. I'm pretty confident that the expert's gonna come in and I'll get pretty close to the asking price that I'm, I'm looking for today, so we'll see. So we have a bust of Julius Caesar. This is one of the only pieces that, well, one of two, this and the Tusculum, that was done during his lifetime. This is a very rare piece. In the solid silver, there were 99. Chad places it at $50,000 for retail value due to its rarity. Corey offers him $30,000, stating that he will have it on the shelf for a long time. Spencer asks him to reconsider and they finally agree on $40,000. For you guys and for the secondary market, I wouldn't pay more than $50,000 because I, you need to make a profit as well. Okay. You know, I know you heard Chad say $50,000. It's gonna take a long time for me to sell it. I mean, it is unique. I'll offer you about thirty. Can we meet in the middle? Forty thousand. Yeah, we can do that. Come on, we gotta do some paperwork. Okay. Meteorite. Christopher wants to part with a meteorite from his collection for four thousand seven hundred dollars. The rock is only a few months old. It contains iron and nickel elements. What have we got there? I have something here that is out of this world. A meteorite. Today, I would like to get 4,700 for my stone. What's it made out of? Uh, nickel, iron, and just ordinary chondritic stone. If you look around the outside edge here, you will see what they call a fusion crust. That's the black line that goes all the way around the outside of it. It's only been on the ground for maybe three to five months, approximately. Only a few months? Yeah. Because he doesn't know much about meteorites, Rick calls his expert to look it over. Robert has been collecting meteorites for over 20 years. I mean, my big problem is I don't deal in meteorites. I want someone to look at it. He'll do whatever he does. I've been hunting meteorites for the last 20 years. It's just a whole lot of fun. It gets me outdoors. It gets me to feel um, I'm young again. I'm, I'm a meteorite hunter. He asked about his history to determine whether Christopher's account is authentic. Robert confirms that it is an actual meteorite, he values it at $4,000 since it has been cataloged. Well, this was found on a dry lake in Southern California. I hit it with my magnet. Okay, so it's, so it's a meteorite? That rock is older than this planet. This is a graded, cataloged meteorite. This is a $4,000 meteorite. Okay. Rick offers him $1,800, and after some head scratching, he states a final offer of $2,100. Christopher is one of the few customers to make 100% profit on his item. I'll give you 1800 bucks. Could you do 2250? It'll look beautiful in here under the lights. I'll give you 21, I'm not gonna, I, I won't give you a dime more. I mean, that's, that's it. 2100 sounds fair. Okay, deal, man. Thank you very much. $2,100 for something that fell from outer space and you know, I didn't really have to do anything except pick it up, and it's pretty good. This is where we'll end our video. We hope you enjoyed watching. Make sure to comment, hit the like and subscribe buttons, hit the notification bell for more videos like this, and share this video with your family and your friends. See you soon.